Hello, everyone, and welcome to Carpet City Cinema, a Gila Films podcast. I'm David Weaver, recording this on Oscars night. Uh, the event is ongoing as we speak, so not everything's come in, but excited to see that a Godzilla film has finally won an Academy Award, Godzilla Minus One, the latest of the Toho films. This is not one of the American-made movies of the Monsterverse franchise. This is from the original creators, the, well, not the original creators, but the studio behind the original Godzilla films. Godzilla Minus One took home the Oscar for Best Visual Effects, and shout out to Robert Downey Jr. for finally claiming the statuette, his third nomination. But that's enough of the living. Let us move on to paying a tribute to those who have passed since our last recording. Um, first up is screenwriter Roberto Leone, Italian, as you may have gathered by that name. He passed away at age 83 and was involved with a number of uh, cult cinema titles. Probably his best known one is uh, Santa Sangre, the uh, Alejandro Orozco film. But uh, also was involved as either a writer or co-writer with such movies as uh, the Kirk Douglas flick The Master Touch, Street People with uh, Stacey Keach and Roger Moore. Uh, and he did some films as well with Sergio Martino, the uh, director of many beloved giallo and horror titles. He worked on American Rickshaw and also uh, his World War II film Casablanca Express. So uh, Roberto Leone. And we also lost actress Jean Allison. She was age 94. Um, horror fans uh, know her for one of her early uh, roles. She didn't really have a lot of lead roles uh, in films, but a couple early on, she was in a, a film called Edge of Fury. That was her film debut. But then, um, like I said, horror films, um, horror film fans will know her from uh, Devil's Partner, which was a movie that came out uh, in the early 60s and that Roger Corman's company, Film Group, uh, distributed. And uh, 1960, actually, to be precise. Uh, and Film Masters just recently put that on Blu-ray. Uh, fun film, a uh, really good fun film with uh, Ed Nelson, a, a regular of... Um, Roger Corman stock stock company and Edgar Buchanan, and uh, she continued to act though in TV spots, guest spots. Showed up in uh, supporting roles in some big films even later on, like uh, Robert Benton's uh, Bad Company, The Western with Jeff Bridges. She was also in Paul Schrader's Hardcore. Uh, had a couple brief marriages earlier on. She was married to Lee Phillips, who was uh, we talked about him before when we uh, did a movie of the week review of The Stranger Within, the Barbara Eden, uh, Rosemary's Baby clone. Um, he, Lee Phillips was an actor, uh, had a really, had the plum male lead role in Peyton Place opposite Lana Turner, but then really wasn't able to quite, uh, quite lock it down as a leading man, but had a lot of success transitioning into directing. And, um, so that was her f first marriage. Then after that, she married, um, FX Tool, who was a boxing trainer and writer mm -hmm. whose, uh, works were the basis for the Clint Eastwood movie, Million Dollar Baby. And, uh, that, that marriage didn't last too long, but then she ended up uh, being married to an engineering student, an electrical engineering student at Stanford U, uh, Philip Torvald, and they stayed married until his death. And then she spent the last uh, years uh, as a companion to Jack Cooper or Calfer, however you pronounce it, uh, the Academy Award nominated cinematographer. But uh, you know, still left behind a, a really nice body of work in terms of just you know a lot of memorable guest appearances. She turned up in a McLeod actually that we, uh, as we're going through that show, we watched that too long ago, playing Randolph Mantus' mother of all things. But Jean Allison, we also lost actor Michael Barrier, age ninety, who is a very familiar face to fans of the original Star Trek series. Uh, you know, you had your kind of like core group of uh, regular characters on that show, uh, you know, Kirk, Scott, uh, Spock, McCoy, blah, blah, blah. But then you had a couple other actors who popped up in a few episodes. It looked like they were going to become kind of a, a running uh, characters, or at least semi-regulars, and then they just kind of disappeared. And Michael Barrier was one of those. He played a crew member named LaSalle, and he had, was in three episodes of the show. He was in uh, This Side of Paradise, which is the one with Joe Ireland and the plants with the spores, and uh, Jim, I'm in love. And he was in uh, The Squire of Gothos, which is one of my personal favorites. Actually, he was in two of my personal favorite episodes. He was in that, and he was also in um, Cat's Paw, the uh, Halloween episode. And uh, Rumor is that they really were hoping to kind of make him uh, 
a little bit more of a mainstay, and for whatever reason, it just didn't pan out. But he uh, ended up showing up in a lot of other shows at the time, you know, Gunsmoke and uh, Mission Impossible, Combat. And only was in two feature films. He had a small part in uh, The Satan Bug, the John Sturges suspense movie. And then he was in the Andy Griffith comedy Angel in My Pocket, which was actually his last acting role period. And ended up going into the legal trade. He uh, went to law school, left acting behind to go do that, and then uh, ended up becoming a legal officer in the Coast Guard. But I always liked him when he showed up in those episodes. He had really striking looks, um, you know, really good uh, physical presence, really kind of took the attention of the camera right to him. Uh, would have liked to see him in more, but hey, we got, we got the three, so that's what it counts. Severn just announced their newest slate of releases. These will be coming out in... Uh, or at least available for pre-order in March, and totally killed it. Uh, really knocked out the park. Four titles, uh, two of which I'm specifically, especially uh, psyched for. All 4K. All movies that have been out on disc before, all have been out on Blu-ray before, uh, but making their 4K debuts, and um, yeah, just really impressive roster. First up, uh, they're putting out The Devil's Honey, the Lucio Fulci movie on 4K, which they had released that on Blu-ray prior. A 1986 title um, about a woman whose uh, boyfriend dies on the operating table, and she ends up uh, taking the doctor, the surgeon, uh, hostage because she blames him for what happened. Um, that that uh, medical professional being played by Brett Halsey, uh, one-time leading man in studio films, uh, who kind of found a whole another career in uh, Europe in appearing in cult cinema, still with us to this day. They're also releasing on 4K, The Great Alligator, 1979 horror movie directed by Sergio Martino, whom we just mentioned. Um, this film had prior uh, release on Blu-ray from Code Red, and uh, it's also known as The Big Alligator River, and uh, I think those two titles can kind of tell you what's going on in here. It's about people being attacked by a really big alligator, and uh got Barbara Bach in the cast, Mrs. Ringo Starr, and uh, a Bond girl, of course, from The Spy Love Me. Also Mel Ferrer, Audrey Hepburn's uh, one-time husband, and uh, a guy with an interesting career in his own right, was a director, and then transitioned into a leading man role, which isn't usually the way that works, uh, back in the 40s into the 50s. And uh, yeah, we had a, had a, a long-term marriage to uh, Audrey Hepburn there. Um, then the next two, though, are the ones I'm really psyched for, uh, that really... Really got me stoked. From 1977, Kathy's Curse. Uh, this is a Canadian uh, film, a exploitation title. Uh, kind of in the vein of all those kind of satanic movies, uh, The Omen and The Exorcist, um, Carrie even, which that's more uh, you know, telekinetic kind of things going on there. But it's about a, you know, a guy... Uh, guy moves into this house with his wife and a young girl and the girl ends up being possessed by the spirit uh of her dead aunt and ends up uh you know wreaking uh wreaking terror and horror uh on those around her this is a film that was forever only available on budget label releases dollar dvds 50 movie packs so that's how i actually first saw it. i remember i got this dollar dvd of it this was like 20 years ago. It was one of those dollar DVDs. It didn't even come in a case. It came in like a little paper sleeve. And the picture was not on the front. It was not from the movie. It was like a picture of like some girl in like tight leather, very like mid 2000 aughts look, uh, kind of s and goth look going on. And completely nothing like what the movie was about, which I knew that. You know, I, I was like, nah, this is not going to be anything like what's in, in here. And uh, it was fun. It was definitely like a fun watch. Um, that was a uh, shorter version, though, than the original full-length uh, edit of the movie. And really never had any expectations that anything would happen with that until Severn released it on Blu-ray a few years back. Um, but the cool thing about this uh, 4K release is that, aside from just the standard uptick in quality you'd expect, is that they're actually, they located the f camera negative. So for their Blu-ray, they had to use a print that was uh, housed in the Canadian archives, Canadian film archives. And while that definitely uh, generated, uh, you know, incredible uh, results compared to what people were used to uh, in terms of viewing this film, uh, being able to access the negative, uh, that's just going to be amazing because you're going to go up so far from a print in terms of quality and detail. Uh, I guess it was, uh, they found the negative actually in uh, France. So uh, really stoked to uh, uh, check out this coming from them. And then the other one uh, that they're putting out, this one coming from 1981, is Butcher Baker Nightmare Maker which some also might know by the title Night Warning. Again, that's how I first saw it uh, on VHS back in the day. Uh, Code Red had also put this out on DVD and Blu-ray. 
But again, just you know, coming up on a 4K release for the original camera negative, uh, really looking forward to seeing seeing what that yields. But this is a really really interesting film, mixture of horror, suspense, mystery. Um, it's about a, a teenage boy played by Jimmy, Jimmy McNichol, Christy McNichol's brother in real life, who's uh, raised by his aunt, the Academy Award nominated legend Susan Tyrell. Um, and she has a very uh, unhealthy affection for him uh, that he's not totally aware of and you know, does not want to see him leave the house as he's uh, about to uh, finish up high school and all that fun stuff. And uh, a murder happens in, in where they live. And the local police uh, detective, played by Bo Svensson, uh, is just uh, locked on to the idea of holding Jimmy McNichol's character responsible for this crime and kind of at the root of a lot of... Um, his uh, his motivation, Bo Svensson's motivation, is that he's extremely anti-gay, and he thinks that Jimmy McNichols' character is gay. And uh, it's a really interesting, um, because there are characters in this film who are gay, but who are not presented in any stereotypical way whatsoever, which was more common at the time. Uh, again, 1981, so we were starting to see some films come out that were progressive and... Um, you know, more realistic in the portrayal of LGBT life, but um, definitely was not a mainstream thing at that time. And this film is, uh, you know, a very advanced look at this kind of thing. Uh, you know, Svensson's character is uh, very interesting, and he does an incredible job playing it. The movie has, um, even beyond that, though, just some really great horror moments. Um, if you're a, a fan of the... Uh, the famous uh, log uh, log timber truck scene from Final Destination. You'll like this movie too, uh, uh, predating that by uh, many years. Um, interesting pedigree in this film too. It's directed by William Asher, who is really better known for uh, you know TV work. He directed a lot of episodes of I Love Lucy, actually, and he directed almost all the Beach Party films. So this was definitely not the kind of film he was known for, but he does a really good job with it. Absolutely. So highly recommend this film if you get a chance to check it out. So Severn totally, totally killing it with these uh, uh, March announcements. All right, we're going to move right on to the movies of the week. That's right, plural. So we'll get right to it. Um, kicking it off with, from 1986, Running Scared. Not the later Paul Walker movie. This is a, uh, a buddy cop film starring Billy Crystal and Gregory Hines. Directed by Peter Hyams, also shot by Peter Hyams. He was also the cinematographer on many, if not maybe all of his films. I, I don't know, but I know that he did he did uh, DP many of his titles. Not a very common thing for a director to handle that duty as well. I know Soderbergh does it, and uh, Robert Rodriguez, but um, definitely in in his era, Hyams uh, was directing in the seventies. That's really where he was coming up. Uh, was definitely not a very common thing to happen. But this film is uh, set in Chicago, and uh, you know, Hines and Crystal play uh, uh, partners on the police force there who are going after uh, a local uh, crime, a mini kingpin, basically played by Jimmy Smits. And uh, they they end up uh, executing a, uh, a bust that goes awry and uh, are forced by their superior officer, the great Dan Hadaya, to... Uh, take a vacation, even if they don't want to. So they head down to the Keys and uh, contemplate just retiring, basically. Like, let's just, this is the good life down here. Why don't we just, uh, you know, quit our job and uh, oh, buy a bar, open up a bar. So they go back to Chicago, the wonderful cold Chicago, and uh, inform their uh, superior of this, only to find out that uh, the Jimmy Spitz character, who they assumed was going to be spending some time in prison, is now... Uh, out and about, and that kind of uh, you know reinvigorates them to to uh, apprehend Smith's character and uh, to to bring him down. So the buddy cop form you know genre. I was reading about the history of it because I know that you know I know from my own watching that you go it became really big in the eighties, but there's always films that you can trace back earlier. And the one that kind of came to my mind was Freebie and the Bean with James Conn and Alan Arkin, which is a really great film from the early 70s and very much fits that buddy cop mold. You know, you got two two guys who have this love-hate kind of relationship going on. Uh, and there's a mixture of, like, action and humor. Um, 
and you know, the the material I was reading kind of traces it back even further to uh, Akira Kurosawa's Stray Dog. Obviously, Lethal Weapon, 48 Hours, stuff like that in the 80s was what really kicked it into high gear. Running Scared comes out 86, so it predates Lethal Weapon by a year, but still post 48 Hours. So, uh, you know, it's it's on the on the first rungs of um, this this boom in this genre that would just kind of become very defining uh, in action throughout the next however long. I mean, it's still basically going on to this day. I mean, you look at like even something like Hobbs and Shaw from the Fast and Furious. You know, the concept is, is still very much in use. Um, they really did a good job with on this film with the casting. That's where uh, you know, as as a whole, if I was to boil down my opinions on the film. It was it was it's a fun diversion. It's not like a great film or uh, even when I say it rises, does it bubble over to the level of very good? No, but it's a really pleasant, you know, uh, escapism for the hour, 40 hour, 50 that you spend with it. And a huge, huge, huge part of that is Crystal and Hines, who have incredible chemistry together, who have great screen presence. Um, it's kind of like I wish. I wish Crystal had done more films like this. You know, Hines did do some other kind of forays into the, you know, somewhat into, he, you know, he did Eve of Destruction, which was kind of like science fiction action mixture. And, you know, White Knights, it, it speaks to his uh, dancing roots, but it also has him, you know, kind of going into some covert stuff. So, uh, but Crystal, you know, for him to play basically like an action guy, uh, very, still very much a Crystal character, very comedic, sarcastic, uh, wisecracking. Uh, it was a nice, it was a nice uh, change of pace. And uh, he uh, carried it out really well. Uh, but yeah, just to, again, how important it is casting in a film? Because um, there's a lot of problems with this movie, uh, especially in the the you know the script and the behavior of the characters. But it it never becomes tiresome to watch. It never becomes boring or dull. And it's just Crystal and Hines. Crystal and Hines completely. Um, you know, draining every drop from the material and making it making it work. It's it's a real kudos to them, real testament to them. But yeah, it's like so when you go into a movie like this, there's always the question of what what do you tolerate? Well, I mean, you can say this way about any movie, right? And we had this conversation. I know um, in one of the earlier episodes, one person watches a movie and sees flaws, and they're like, "Oh man, I couldn't get past those flaws in a movie." Another person sees the same movie. He they might even see the same flaws, but they're like, "Oh, you know, I take it in stride." You know, I uh, the the uh, good outweighs the bad. And I think one time we talked about this in regards to Perry Mason, which is a show I've constantly seen the praises of, the original Perry Mason from the fifties and sixties. And a lot of you know, some people always bust on that show, which is generally regarded as a classic show. You know, so. Emmy Award winner was on for like nine years. Um, but some people bust on it because uh, every episode ends with this uh, tear-filled uh, confession from the whoever the killer is uh, that is completely unrealistic in the fact that, you know, no one would ever break down in a moment like that and confess to a crime. Um, it's something that some people, you know, really rib on the show, but it's something that I actually like about the show because I understand why they did that and uh, why they, why they went with that mechanism in the plots. You know, they they had the constraints of like a 51 minute runtime. And uh, a lot of that was devoted to the uh, setup and uh, of, of the crime and the uh, mechanics of the criminal proceedings and trying to find out who was really guilty. And so they're trying to wrap it up really quickly at the end. Um, and they're using that as a as a way to do that. And not only that, but they knowing that there was an improbability to all these people breaking down and confessing, they kind of leaned into it. We always talked about that. Um, that they they uh, said, okay, you know, this it's not if it's not realistic that someone's going to break down and confess to a crime, but we're going to go with this anyways because. Um, you know, it's it's it solves the whole problem of having uh, uh, of wrapping up the proceedings in like two minutes. Then let's play it to the hilt. Let's really, you know, play it to the back row. And these people are going to go into incredible histrionics when this happens. And it just made it really entertaining and fun. But I get why some people wouldn't like that. Why they would have a problem with it and thinking thinking it's improbable. So how does this connect to Running Scared? Well, you know, Running Scared is the kind of film that there's a lot of problems with logic in it. And I say this knowing that some people may be like, oh, come on, give it cut some slack. It's an action movie. It's an 80s action movie. But it wasn't a film where I could kind of give it that leeway. It, Although 
you know, like I said, you know, Crystal and Hines bring a, a lot of strength. It wasn't to the degree that uh, I could overlook the flaws in it. Yeah, I think I think it was what was it? Cobra came out the same year as this, right? I think that was eighty six, and that's a film with just a lot. If the flaws in Running Scared are are uh, you know uh, serious injuries, then the flaws in, then the logical flaws in Cobra could be described as mortal wounds. But Cobra is you know to me a classic. It's uh, you know as I did enjoy Running Scared, but Cobra is a great film because even though it has all this insane, stupid stuff in it, it does bring to it a style. And uh, a vibe that completely uh, mixes well with that. But with Running Scared, um, you know, one of the big problems is Jimmy Smith's character, this criminal, uh, who we're supposed to, at the very least, take him, ser- even if we don't, as a viewer, don't fear him, we're at least supposed to take him seriously as, like, this bad guy who's able to get away with, you know, crime after crime, who's a real threat to the, to the city and to uh, Heinz and Crystal. And his character just engages in so much... Uh, poorly thought out, just dumb behavior that it really just makes him very weak as an antagonist. It, and I don't think it was intentional on the part of the filmmakers. I mean, to a degree, there are times, obviously, where like Crystal is, you know, ribbing on Smiths and Heinz is ribbing on Smiths, and that's meant to be something that we kind of join in on the laughter at. But there are deliberate um, actions that Smith's character takes that I don't think we're supposed to see as flawed and yet they are. They, you know, he, he's constantly, anytime some kind of criminal act is being carried out, whether it's a drug deal or, uh, you know, there's uh, going to be an attempt made to kill a cop or, or whatever it is, Smith is always on the scene to it, like personally uh, be involved with it. Even though he has all these guys working for him, you know, walking around carrying machine guns, uh, engaging in some pretty brazen criminal activity in Chicago, uh, a city which has you know a decent sized police force, um, he always feels the need to be on the scene too, like as if he wants to get incriminated. He, you know, there's no sense of like layer of separation uh, in his uh, the power structure of his criminal organization. He's always there, and uh, he also has a tendency as his character to like overreact to situations, to show no sense of cool or uh, composure or anything that would make me think that he has the the strength of leadership to even command the size of force he does the command the the loyalty he does again some people might watch this and say oh that's kind of intentional he's meant to be like that but it just to me it made the character you know really hard to take seriously as an antagonist the film also has really you know very difficult to swallow uh, setups for certain for certain scenes in the movie the climax of the film takes place uh in a state building where, you know, I won't go too much into spoiler territory, but basically, um, you know, Smith is and his goons uh, are going, are trying to arrange a handoff with uh, Crystal and Heinz. There's something that Crystal and Heinz have that Smith wants and vice versa. And so the place that in Smith's character, this criminal determines where, where this is going to take place. So he chooses this state building in, um, in Chicago and uh, they they do kind of like reference it in the in the dialogue like they're you know crystal and Hines are like wow why would he pick up a place like that that's so you know it's a government building it's uh, you know very high profile and you know, their their kind of rationale and explaining it away is that uh, you know he thinks because it's so high high profile that Smith feels comfortable there because he thinks that you know crystal and Hines won't try anything because there's so many other people there. And the reality is it's completely ridiculous because not only do they do they have this kind of handoff take place in this giant government building in downtown Chicago, we're also supposed to believe that when Crystal and Hines get there, you know, all the all the security there, which is like their 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 state employees, or like National Guard or state troopers or whatever, they've been um taken prisoner by Smith and his men and they, they've they've tied him up and put him in like a, a cage in the uh, like a utility cage um in like the basement and got all their guns away from them and so we're supposed to believe that Smith, who we've already kind of been established as not the most competent criminal was somehow able to go into downtown chicago at night into a government building that has like at least eight or nine armed guards in it and was able to apprehend each one 
get their weapons away, and all this happened without any alarms being triggered, without a shot going off. And, you know, it's this kind of repetition of this kind of thing, this kind of, like, lapse in logic that's, it's more than just a, uh, like, oh, okay, it's something I have to have a, a slight stretch of uh, belief for, disbelief for. It's it's a pretty huge, that's like a, uh, you know, an evil can evil 10 bus jump to, to buy into that. And I think it's one of those things where, like, the, so the building that they shot this at, because they shot on location in Chicago, it is a really cool building, and it really serves the end well. And I think it was one of those situations where, like, oh, you know where we should shoot the climax of this movie? We should shoot it in that building, and that's that one building in downtown Chicago. And then it's like they have to reverse engineer a way to explain how this is going to happen logically with the characters, and they couldn't quite figure it out. Uh, so they just kind of like, eh, we'll come up with some dialogue real quick to have to explain why they would be meeting in this really high profile place. That is something though, though to say for the filmmakers, they got a lot done in Chicago. I, I don't, I don't know to what degree it is difficult to film in there now. I mean, you obviously have great Chicago movie like, uh, the fugitive that came after this. Um, this film has a, is known for a car chase scene that was actually done on the L uh, where, you know, Crystal and Hines are in a car chasing after Smith and they're driving on the train tracks and the L and you know, I wouldn't say it's ranks on the level of like a bullet or French connection in terms of car chase, but it is impressive that they just got that done, that they are able to convince, you know, authorities like, can we shut down the, the L in Chicago for a little bit so we could do a car chase? Um, that's really uh it's impressive. It's definitely impressive from a, a, a production standpoint. We got uh, Darlan Flugel and Tracy Reed as the love interests in the film. Darlan Flugel plays uh, Crystal's ex-wife, who they have kind of like again a love-hate thing kind of going on between them, where she couldn't stand his work, and but they still love each other. And then um, Tracy Reed, who speaking of McLeod, was on that show, uh, kind of had a recurring role as the wife of uh, McLeod's partner. She plays this. Uh, a woman who's in a relationship, but that Gregory Hines is kind of spent with her, and, and it's reciprocal, and they're trying to figure out how to make that work. Uh, they both are also really good, but their parts are really underdeveloped. Uh, you know, both give really good uh, uh, personable performances, um, but they definitely feel kind of in the overall scheme of things kind of shoehorned into the script. I think that the whole seems to take place when they go down to Florida. That could have been probably trimmed a little bit uh, when Gregory Hines and Billy Crystal go down there, and then they could have used that time just to even expand it a little. It doesn't. They, it's not like they need a ton more time on the screen, but I think just to make them perhaps a little more consistently appear throughout the film and a little more consistently part of the narrative, that would have made them, uh, you know, have a little bit more uh, of an impression. Um, there's also the parts of these uh, two more rookie cops. Newer cops, not rookies, but newer cops, younger cops, Turks, who get brought in for uh, Heinz and Crystal to kind of mentor. And they're played by uh, Stephen Bauer early on and uh, John Grease or Grise. I, I don't, I might be butchering that. The son of Tom Grise, uh, the famed director. Uh, John Grise, of course, a lot of people know him from Napoleon Dynamite. But, uh, and then he was just recently on White Lotus. But they, they're good. They're good choices for those roles because they both have really. This is like early on when they're they're much younger and they just have this really great physical, very strikingly physical presence, especially because they're like you know, really big next to Crystal. That whole dynamic going on. Um, but yeah, it was nice to see them show up there. Joey, Joe Pantoliano uh, also is on hand. Uh, uh, they, yeah, again, always a welcome sight to see uh, playing a snake, one of Jimmy Smith's uh, hoods. And then you had some other really great character actors like Larry Hankin and Don Kalfa showing up as well. Interestingly, the film script, which had been around for a little while, was uh, originally meant to center on two older cops who were retiring. And it was Hyams who pushed for to make the characters younger cops who wanted to retire. There were even rumors of like Paul Newman maybe being involved. Um, you know, there's a, there's a whole list of names that kind of were bandied about. And... Uh, but yeah, he's the you know Hyams came in and he uh, he uh, got them to uh, you know change that that premise a bit. Film ended up being though a modest success, not a huge hit, but it did decent. And you know Billy Crystal, this was a you know, kind of it wasn't his like so technically his first leading role would have been in Rabbit Test, the nineteen seventy eight comedy that Joan Rivers directed. But that was really it until this movie. You know he obviously was on the show Soap and he was on Saturday Night Live and all that. But um, 
he actually hadn't even been in a theatrically released film since 1980, which was uh, Animal Olympics, which was just the voice voice work for that. Um, but so this was really kind of, even though it's not his first lead role or f- or feature f- film role, it, it is in many ways his kind of like starring debut. And, and then it was the next year was The Princess Bride and Throw Mama from the Train. And so then things were kind of, you know, off for him. But uh, again, would have really liked to have, it would have been cool if they actually done a sequel to this. But alas, such was not to be the case. I like Gregory Hines. I always liked him and stuff. Uh, you know, whether he pops up on Law and Order or just shows up in a film, uh, you know, very sad that he we lost him so so young. And obviously an incredibly gifted dancer. But yeah, it's definitely worth watching. It doesn't rise to the levels of kind of like some of the films that I always think of more as the definitive buddy cop films like Freebie and the Bean or Dead Heat. Hey, right? Treat Williams, Joe Piscopo, Zombies. That's a fun one. Shane Black even shows up in that. But I digress. All right. The second film. The second movie of the week. So you thought we were done talking about The Omen. Well, we are, kind of. But I, after going through the, uh, the three theatrically released movies, I really wanted to watch a specific film, not the fourth one that was made for cable TV, but a film from 1977 called The Chosen. Uh, this is not the uh, Robbie Benson drama, nor is it the current faith-based retelling of Jesus. This is a 1977 film. Actually, it was a, originally released in Europe under the title Holocaust 2000. The Chosen was the uh, the American title given to it by uh, American International Pictures, which uh, distributed it here. And uh, this is definitely uh, an Omen clone, an Omen ripoff. Starring none other than Kirk Douglas, Amsterdam's hometown hero. So in this film, uh, Kirk Douglas uh, runs a company, um, huge, huge, powerful, uh, globally powerful company, that's planning to uh, build a giant nuclear power plant in the desert of a Middle Eastern country. And there's a lot of protests going on about that. Um, a lot of opposition. There's some political opposition from different factions in in this Middle Eastern country. And as Douglas goes about trying to uh, carry out this mission, carry out this this uh, this vision he has to build this plant, he starts finding that people who get in the way, um, anybody who kind of like appears to be an opposing force to getting this plant built, they die mysterious uh, deaths, which he is not responsible for. You know, he's not the one behind this, but it occurs nonetheless. And he starts to become aware that the events that are unfolding, that there could be a a correlation between these events, him trying to build this power plant, the people who are dying, and the prophecies in the book of Revelation about the end times. And that this also could all be tied into the rise of the Antichrist who may be someone a lot closer to him than he realizes, or is it? So a Facebook friend of mine, I posted that I had watched this movie, and they commented, uh, they said, not dumb enough to be great and not good enough to be memorable. And that's kind of a decent way to um, encapsulate the movie, I guess. But I think they're, they're a little too hard on it. I think it's it's better than that. Uh, so The Omen comes out in 1976, uh, and uh, obviously a huge hit. The kind of the third of the trilogy of uh, classic Satan horror movies following uh, Rosemary's Baby in 68 and The Exorcist in 73. The Omen, it was released in June of 76, and by August, it, they were already talking sequels. So that speaks, obviously, it was a huge, huge financial uh, hit for Fox. Now, the second Omen film, Damien, that, you know, obviously, like I said, they had talked about the fact they were going to do sequels. Um, not too long after the first movie came out, it didn't actually start filming, I believe it was October of 77, and then it was released in 78. This film, The Chosen, this shot in uh, April 77, that's when they started shooting this. So it was actually, they actually finished shooting this film before they even started shooting Damien, which is kind of interesting because like there's a key kill scene in each movie, um, and they're very kind of similar in idea. Uh, Kind of almost makes me wonder, did did they see the chosen? Did the guys who make uh, the makers of Omen Two see the chosen and maybe kind of get an idea for one of their kill scenes from it? But this was a uh, a European co-production between uh, the United Kingdom and Italy. 
and was directed by uh, Alberto De Martino. And uh, you know, De Martino was a veteran of genre cinema. Um, B films. He had directed, uh, you know, spaghetti westerns. He had directed, uh, you know, sword and sandal movies, horror films. Uh, actually, uh, 1974, he directed a movie called The Antichrist, which, despite its title, is actually not really another. Obviously, it can't be an Omen clone. It came up before it, but it's actually an Exorcist uh, a clone ripoff. Um, and uh, right before this, he had done uh, Shadows in an Empty Room with Stuart Whitman. He also has the distinction or dishonor, whatever you want to call it, of having directed, I think, two movies that Mystery Science Theater 3000 Rift, uh, The Puma Man, and uh, O.K. Connery, the uh, James Bond ripoff that starred uh, Neil Connery, Sean's brother, also known as Operation Kid Brother, that film. But, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of, I kind of wonder what the process was to bring him on to this. I mean, it's definitely not outside of his wheelhouse. It totally makes sense, like the film, what it is, the plot, the genre, the budget level. I just, I guess, and this is probably totally like one of those situations that speaks to my ignorance, with Kirk Douglas at the lead, and we'll get a little more into where Kirk Douglas was in his career at this point, I guess I still would have thought they would have had a little bigger name director than this. Uh, I guess it's not really totally out, outside uh, you know, of expectations, but... It is. It is just. I. I, I kind of wonder what went into the process of him being the director. I mean, he does actually a, a decent job directing it, but it's still. I. I kind of. I'd like to know more. It's hard to find out a lot about the making of this movie. Uh, you know, I watched the Blu-ray the Screen Factory put out. It doesn't have any. Uh, you know, historically retrospective uh, bonus features like commentaries or anything. I have uh, Kirk Douglas, of course, being from Amsterdam. I have his autobiography, Ragman's son. He does not give any mention to this film, even though he does, you know, he mentions light at the edge of the world, his cannibal Jules Verne pirate movie with the old Brenner, but he does not touch on, um, the chosen, you know, I, I found it to be what it claimed to be, it, what it's, it appears to be, you know, just a, an enjoyable, fun, schlocky ripoff. <laughs> of the omen um i think that it maintained a better pace uh, probably more so in the first half of the film um which isn't to say that the second half was slow or dull but it definitely had more momentum in the first half um you know it, it totally lacks obviously the thing like when we talked about what makes the omen work and what makes the second omen film work you know it, it completely lacks the uh the sense of you know impending doom and mystery that that were so key to the success of the first Omen film, and it lacks the just the overall visual power of those two films, how incredibly well shot they were and made they were. You know, it does have some memorable scenes in terms of its aesthetic in the Chosen. Uh, you know, there's some scenes that take place in a mental institution where they uh, really do a lot with like, uh, the color white and, uh, you know, some, some good production design for those scenes. There's also a, a memorable, um, scene that takes place basically at this huge, wide, expansive beach that, uh, becomes, un, you know, unexpectedly flooded. And there's some really nice wide, wide shots of that locale. But, uh, other than that, it's, it's definitely, you know, it, I mean, when you think about Damien Omen 2 and just how incredible, mas incredibly masterful Bill Butler's cinematography was, or if you think even of the first Omen film, like I, like I keep talking about it, the scene at the, the graveyard and uh, that film and just how, uh, you know, how gothically spooky that was. There's nothing of that caliber in uh, The Chosen. Uh, Aneo Morcone did the music for this, uh, the legendary uh, Italian composer. And... Uh, it's you know it, it's kind of an interesting mixture of some sturdy uh, you know suitable music I guess but it does have some uh, this one theme I tried to find it on YouTube what the name of the specific track was there is a a track that is basically it's it's horror track the film has you know there's there's kind of like this romantic theme that they keep coming back to uh, there's kind of like the more uh, you know more run of the mill just whatever the scene calls for music but there's this one more is the definitively horror bound track of the score that it comes to comes back to. And I was trying to find the name of that specific track, but I couldn't find it, but that was really good. What Morricone did with that. And it was really, they, they use it during, I believe during that scene, uh, when, on the beach where Kirk Douglas goes to, uh, uh meet, uh, uh, 
uh, scientist, a uh, renowned scientist played by Alexander Knox, the Academy Award nominated actor. And they go to meet on this expansive beach that just suddenly inexplicably starts to fill with water uh, from an auditory level. You know, Morricone definitely, you know, is able to d- deliver the goods at times. It's definitely a lower budget, obviously a lower budgeted film than, than the Omen movies. This isn't like a big studio production. And that does show. It absolutely shows at times. Um, they're not able to bring the scope to it that it really kind of calls for. I mean, when you were making the the Omen and Damien Omen 2 and you're selling these characters like Gregory Peck and William Holden as these world ambassadors, you know, surrounded by power and these huge cities, you know, you're making, you got 20th Century Fox playing, paying the bankroll, so there's, you know, no expense spared to create that reality. Whereas in this film, again, you're trying to sell the similar concept that Kurt Douglas is this, you know, really powerful businessman and uh, traveling among world leaders and whatnot. And for example, there's a scene where he goes to this airport to meet the leader of a country, and the leader of the country arrives in a like helicopter or something, and uh, he goes up. There's a crowd of people there to meet this world leader, and it it's like twenty people, <laughs> you know. They're trying to they're trying to sell it as like this huge throng of people that are there to support him, and you know he's going to shake their hands and kiss their babies and all that stuff. And as soon as you get to like a wide enough shot, you see it's like 20 extras on this giant empty airport. And, and there's also scenes like that, other scenes like that too, where just the, the films, um, you know, the film's lower budget really kind of come to the front. I'm, I'm guessing too, that a lot of the budget on this went to the actors, went to like, especially Kirk Douglas, that he probably, his salary, you know, and that's not uh, a slight on him. It's just that's probably where a lot of the money went to. And they filled out a lot of the supporting roles with, you know, some well-known character actors. Like I mentioned, the Alexander Knox, you know, who was a, uh, a leading man in Hollywood back in the 40s, uh, a nominated Best Actor for uh, played Woodrow Wilson in in uh, the appropriately titled uh, biopic Wilson, uh, whose career, unfortunately, was uh, hindered by the Hollywood blacklist. You know, he's he's in the film. Anthony Quayle, Academy, another Academy Award nominee, a great actor uh, from films like The Guns of Navarone and Lawrence of Arabia. He plays one of the scientists on um, Kirk Douglas's staff. Always a great actor. Always great to see him uh, in films. Uh, Virginia McKenna, who uh, you know, had success with uh, Born Free and had been around before that, too, of course. Uh, but she and her husband in real life, actor Bill Travers, they were in Born Free and did some other animal themed movies. She has a small part in the film as Kirk Douglas's wife. And then uh, Simon Ward uh, playing uh, Kirk Douglas's son in the film, Kirk Douglas's son Angel, which is actually a really good casting. Like the whole idea is that Kirk Douglas, uh, you know, he, he married, he came over to England from America and uh, his character helped, you know, build up this this company that he now runs, uh, and it was owned by basically like his wife, Virginia McKenna's family. So they have a son who is therefore appropriately played by a British actor because he would have grown up in Britain. But Simon Ward, a really good actor who uh, was enjoying the most success of his of his career, basically in the seventies, he had um, played young a young Winston Churchill in Richard Attenborough's uh, Academy Award nominated biopic Young Winston. He had been in, in uh, Richard Lester's uh, Three Musketeers films as the Duke of Buckingham. Um, he played James Harriet in the All Creatures Great Small film and was also uh, in uh, Dan Curtis's Dracula. And so this was kind of like his his decade. This is kind of uh, where his, his career had the most to shine. The Chosen is kind of like, I think kind of is basically where th- around the time where things kind of start to turn and he's doing kind of, he begins to do things that are a little more uh, B-ish, you know, uh, making his way into uh, 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 titles like, um, you know, Dominique, the horror film with Cliff Robertson and Supergirl. Uh, but he's a good actor. Uh, and he's really well cast as Douglas' son because they, they do have enough physical characteristics alike that you can buy them as being father and son. I mean, the script obviously lacks any of the the craft that went into the Omen films, the first two Omen films. Uh, you know, we talk about how the Omen kind of hinted at the supernatural. It always, like, obviously it's a film that dealt with the supernatural and uh, was open about the role the supernatural played in the film's events, but also kind of wanted to, at times give credence to the idea that what was that what was happening in the film could be viewed as coincidental like even though we as the audience knew that supernatural things were at work it wanted to at least give the opportunity to gregory peck's character that to believe uh realistically that all the things all the events that were happening in that movie could be explained away and it gets into the whole idea you know of 
Damien, the Antichrist, being the son of a, a jackal. His mother's a jackal. And, you know, if you, you hear all kinds of names being given to Satan, the devil, Lucifer, whatever you want to call him over the years, and nicknames, uh, Lord of Flies, everything like that. And, you know, uh, you don't think of them necessarily in the most literal sense. When you hear the term Lord of the Flies, you don't necessarily think of him, you know, as being on the top hierarchy of the, uh, of the fly species. And in the Omen, they that's kind of like when when you have that scene where Gregory Peck and David Gordon go to the cemetery to find the tomb of Damien's mother. Uh, and they open it up, and you just see an animal skeleton in there, and they let it close. And then, of course, it's not too long after that before they get attacked by all the Rottweilers. It's like the film, it goes just enough, just far enough to literalize the concept of his mother really being a jackal without really actually, like you know, having a scene of a jackal give birth to a human being. It, it, it's like this glimpse of this animal skeleton. You're like, whoa, he really is the son of a jackal. And, and they don't dwell on it. It's just there for a, a second as like a horror moment, a shock moment. And then we get into like Damien Owen too. And we talked about this when and re, when I when I reviewed that film, how it's like, which I, I like that film. It's a good film, but they kind of went a little too much into literalizing things where we actually, you know, one of the, one of the ways that a character f- begins to suspect something is odd about Damien is that, uh, you know, uh, it's a doctor played by Meshach Taylor who uh, is examining his blood when Damien has to be in the hospital. And it's like, oh, he's got jackal DNA or jackal blood cells. It's like, okay, maybe that's a little too on the nose. I don't think we need to go that far with like the whole son of a jackal thing. And so the chosen is like that, like the Damien Omen two level, but even more so where like there's, it's almost like some of the things that happen in, in the chosen to uh, a point toward the existence and, and plots of the antichrist are, uh, I mean, they're like, they're almost more like out of science fiction than they are out of like horror. They're, you know, computers generating numbers that have, uh, you know, supernatural uh, interpretations and, it's kind. Of, I mean, it's what I would expect in some ways. It's not. I guess. Well, I don't know if I'd say it's what I expect. It's not surprising considering that you know this is basically it's a it's a ripoff. It's a clone. It's 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 a quick attempt to get in on the action of the Omen, um, and um, so the fact that they would you know not have the finesse of the scripts of those films isn't isn't shocking. It, it does have its own sense of fun to it uh, that they're doing things like that. Um, but at the same time, it, it also does limit its ability to succeed on the level of of the omen. And there's definitely a lot of ridiculous things happening. That again, if you're if you're talking about movies in which the premise is an antichrist, a child of the devil, I guess you could argue that anything is ridiculous in a movie like that. But again, we go back to the whole concept of a film creates its own mythology, its own rules, and as long as it plays within those rules and plays so well, then the film is doing right, and that's what the omen did. And and you know, Damien Omen. Too, did it pretty well too and the chosen is just you know trying to create a world in which on one hand we're supposed to believe that kurt douglas is a realistically uh viable um you know, leader of a whole this huge business conglomerate and he's going to realistically be able to build you know nuclear power plant in this middle eastern country and all these you know things of that nature are are put forth in a very uh matter of fact manner but then you also have a scene where you know kurt douglas uh, goes to a sanitarium uh, to uh, he's asked there by uh, the psychiatrist there to so that he can interact with the, uh, a patient there who has killed someone close in close to Kirk Douglas and you have to go to the sanitarium and they go into this room to be with this patient and the patient quickly has like a spaz out moment and is over to overpower the psychiatrist and the one attendant there and starts beating up on Kurt Douglas because like apparently this place is just like, ah, it's okay to have a, a murderer just, um, you know, be within a foot of a, of, of, uh, of an everyday citizen. And we'll just have like a, a 70 year old overweight doctor and one attendant there. And it's, well, we don't need more security than that. It's things like that that happen in the film that, um, where there, where there is no urgency to create reality, where uh, plot holes uh, uh, run loose, um, it's that kind of uh, schizophrenic approach the film has. Um, they definitely, again, it, it can make for scenes that are fun in and of themselves. It's, it's, it's humorous to see, uh, you know, these 
again, again in that scene, the the uh, institutionalized patient suddenly berserk out and have it one on one with Kirk Douglas. It's just that in the broad scheme of things, it's such an unrealistic uh, uh, situation and laughably so that it takes away from the ability of the film to rise to a higher level. And, and that kind of thing happens uh, throughout the film. And again, the budget, going back to the budget, there are other parts where the budget really pulls back. I mean, the, the whole idea of Kirk Douglas building this nuclear plant is that it's like, it's kind of uh, matches up with the uh, prophecies of a seven headed beast in the book of revelation this this plant this power plant is is supposed to be what that refers to in the bible so there's a scene where kirk douglas has this basically this fever dream and it's incredibly entertaining on one hand because he's basically running naked kirk douglas full frontal running naked across the desert like across salt flats and then witnessing his nuclear power plant rise out of the ocean and then like transform into a seven headed monster, but they just don't have the budget to carry off even uh, like an effect like that. Well, so it's just Godzilla level 1960s Godzilla level, uh, model work with some, you know, optical, a little bit of optical effects going on. And, um, or even again, like we, I was talking before about that scene where the Kirk Douglas is at a beach that, all of a sudden it starts flooding. And it was a really good idea as that scene was progressing and I realized what they were doing that he's, you know, he's standing there, the water is just rising higher and higher and he has to find himself running for dry land and, and Neil Morricone is killing it with that, that horror, that horror theme that I mentioned. Um, but it was obvious, you know, it was, it was, I was liking the idea of it. I was like, Oh, this is a really cool idea of, of, of the way these events could be turning right now, but they didn't have the budget to pull it off. They just had to basically, you know, show Kirk Douglas standing on a beach and then cut to close-ups and insert shots of water moving back and forth and then cut back to Kirk Douglas and now he's running and the water's up to his ankles and, and keep doing this. And the next time we go back to Kirk Douglas, the water is a little higher. And they didn't obviously have the ability to uh, create a, the scene as it really should be where you know, he's standing on dry ground and it just becomes flooded. They had to just kind of work on their tight budget and just be like, Hey Kirk, can you just run in a little further out into the water and we'll, you know, wait till you get out to ankle high and, and we'll film you running around in ankle high water. And then when we get that, you'll go out a little further out into the surf where it's like knee high and we'll film some shots of that. You know, they just didn't have the budget really to pull off, uh, you know, scenes, um, to their most powerful effect. The ending was kind of interesting in the sense that, you know, the Omen films, of course, are known for their, um, you know, bleak, bleak endings um, that can serve to set up a sequel, but also are very nihilistic. And I feel like this film, they wanted to continue that trend. Like, I'm not going to give away the ending. No spoilers here. But, like, I feel like they wanted to basically continue that trend uh, and follow on that, as I would expect uh a clone, uh, a film clone to do, but at the same time, they also, I felt like, like Kirk Douglas maybe wanted a more traditional Hollywood ending. And so they tried to find something that was, uh, somewhere in the middle. <laughs> and I guess if you watch the ending now through modern day eyes, uh, you would think they were just trying to set up for a sequel and that's why they ended the way they do. Um, but I don't know if they were necessarily thinking about a sequel when they made this, um, you know, sequels, they were a thing, but they're not as, as, as automatically thought of as they are now with cinema. And I don't know that a film like this, that they would really, uh, you know, at this budget level, that they were even thinking in terms of sequels as much as just cashing in on the omen. Um, so I think, yeah, I think it was more just the ending is speaks more to, uh, perhaps trying to, uh, please different creative forces than it does to any more, um, long view, long view, uh, ideas. I mean, it's a horror film. So how does it do with the horror moments? I mean, it does have some memorable kill scenes for sure. Um, memorable, uh, horror bites in that sense, but it's also, those are, it's always done within the confines, like I said, of it being lower budgeted and it being, um, less creative, you know, obviously just having a lower budget in and of itself is not a, a cause for, uh, a lesser a lesser end result um you know the original night of the living dead or carnival of souls speak to how you can pull create a horror classic uh an iconic horror film with next to no resources but this film you know it's not just that it's on a low budget it's also that it it lacks the vision and the imagination that were present in the uh first two omen films 
But again, to the film's defense, it does have the kind of crazy craziness that kind of can come with being a schlocky ripoff where you can do wild things like have Kirk Douglas run naked across a desert because you're not worried. Your, your goal is to get this film done, done quickly and done uh, uh, in a way that can cash in on the success of another film. So if you have a wild idea like that, you can just put it in the movie. You're like, whereas if this was a, a studio film, there'd be probably people or st- sitting around the table. There'd be enough, there'd be enough levels of insulation, um, between whoever comes up with an idea like that and the idea actually being executed, uh, that one person along the way would be like, Hey, well, maybe we shouldn't have Kirk Douglas run naked across the desert. Maybe that's a little too crazy. Um, and in a film like this, where it's just, you know, obviously I'm sure a tighter schedule, tighter budget, and it's more just kind of do what you want, just help us to make money off the omen, um, that things like that can kind of slip in and that does give it its own sense of energy and fun and creativity, um, which makes it, you know, like I said, it's an enjoyable, it's an enjoyable, uh, viewing experience. Now, Kirk Douglas, going back to him, first off, this is the first time I've seen a Kirk Douglas movie, uh, that I hadn't seen already in some time. It's been a while since I've actually just sat down and had a first time watch with a Kirk Douglas film. Uh, you know, I've seen you know, many of his movies, obviously, uh, being from his hometown. And uh, the thing that kind of really stood out to me in you know, watching this film, the, something that I was already obviously aware of, but just really reminded me of it. I guess it, I don't know, it was just it was kind of interesting how it struck me. It's just again how good of an actor he is. This this is a film that if you were to hear about it, and maybe this just speaks to people's or my own prejudices or judgmentalism, that we might just think, oh, this is just gonna be like some paycheck thing. He's gonna phone in the performance. This is just an omen ripoff. But um, he does a really good job. He gives a really good performance in this. It's not he, and, and you know he is a as I look back over his career and think of all the kinds of movies I've seen him in, he never phones it in. And and that's awesome. That's, that's a true testament to him. Like this, this is very much just a ripoff movie. It's very much ripping off another film and he brings it all to bear. You know, he, he's very believable as this, you know, um, businessman who truly believes that what he's doing is going to be of benefit to the world. He's uh, brings really good nuance to the scenes with Simon Ward and his son. He really comes up, you know, he, he, he really sells that relationship between them. They have good rapport in this movie. Um, and like I said, that, that they have some physical resemblance, but also just, they, they come across like father and son. He comes across something like really cares about his son. Um, just everything that the role calls upon the physicality of it at times but also the uh the the dramatic talent um the dramatic necessities of the part he executes it all really well he doesn't you know he doesn't like i said he doesn't just uh walk through the part nor does he overplay it you know i think sometimes there's a easy to kind of stereotype Douglas a little bit, kind of like that Charlton Heston vein, not to that extreme as, as, as maybe playing it a little too big at times, but he doesn't, he really, he really gives a really good performance in the film. So Douglas made his film debut in 1946 in the strange love of Martha Ivers, a, a mixture of film noir and romantic kind of melodrama. Good film, really good film. He was, um, not the leading man in that. That went to uh, a Van Heflin, but he was uh, fourth built uh, after uh, after uh, Barbara Stanwyck, Van Heflin, and Elizabeth Scott. He got the introducing Kurt Douglas on the posters. So that comes out in 1946, and uh, over the next few years, he you know he shows up in some really acclaimed films like Morning Becomes Electra, Out of the Past, the classic film noir with Robert Mitchum, A Letter to Three Wives. And it's really a champion, I think, 1949. Uh, not his first lead role, but it was really the, his, the role that made him a star. It got him the first of his Oscar nominations. So if you look at that, that comes out in 49. And you look at like the next you know, 15 to 20 years. I'm not going to read off every film he did in that time period, but this is just a sampling of the movies just to speak to you know, his filmography. So you got 
uh, Ace in the Hole in 51, the classic Billy Wilder film. 51 is also when he does Detective Story. Uh, 52, The Bad and the Beautiful, that gets him his second Best Actor nomination. 54, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which is just an incredibly fun uh, classic Disney film. Uh, 56, Lust for Life, gets him his third Best Actor nomination. 57, Gunfight at the OK Corral and Paths of Glory. Uh, 59, The Devil's Disciple. 60, Spartacus, which he, of course, also was a producer on that. Um, 62, he does Lonely Are the Brave, which I believe he considered his best film or his most favorite film. Uh, 64, Seven Days in May. And then uh, 67, you have The War Wagon with him and John Wayne, which was a, a big hit. And that's when it kind of you start to see after that his career starts to uh, begin kind of like this uh, downward move. 68, he does A Lovely Way to Die, which is a Dior Noir film, which it's kind of been, you know, recently finally got a Blu-ray release, which is great. But at the time it came out, I don't think we made much of an impression. And that same year, he also did The Brotherhood, which you know had some good pedigree behind it. It was directed by Martin Ritt, really big director. Um, but it didn't fare well at the box office, even though it's it's been, again, kind of reevaluated in more recent years. And it kind of put the, the curse on the idea of doing a mafia movie, which is what that was. In fact, Paramount which made The Godfather, also made The Brotherhood. And one of the reasons they were concerned about making The Godfather is because The Brotherhood hadn't done well. And so then in 69, he does, uh, Douglas, Kirk Douglas does The Arrangement, which, again, a great pedigree there. Ilya Kazan directing uh, based off his own novel and really was not very well met, very well received by critics. Um, and then 1970, he does There Was a Crooked Man, with, which is considered uh, a really good film that he did with Henry Fonda. And then after that, he begins kind of like this journey in Europe. He starts to starts to make movies uh, over in Europe for a bit. Like he does uh, To Catch a Spy and The Light at the Edge of the World, uh, The Master Touch in 72, uh, Scalawag, which he also directed in 73. But a lot of the movies he's doing are just not really, nothing is really uh, catching on. And some of the European stuff is definitely... Again, it's not low budget, but he's definitely working on a lower, a lower tier than, than he he had been before that. And it's you know, Burt Lancaster and him are also all, often talked about in the same kind of regards. Partly because they made many movies together, they starred together in Seven Days in May and Gunfight at the OK Corral and others, and they also came up at the same time. I mean, you know, Lancaster's first film was also in '46. It was The Killers, although in his in his case, he he got a starring role right from the jump. But Lancaster, he's even though he also had films in his career that weren't well, necessarily um, well received at the box office or with critics, he still had this uh, a very consistent trajectory to his career where he was always doing something interesting, something successful. There was never like really this extended down period in, in his filmography um, you know as his health declined in the late 80s um, that's probably the weakest time in his in his filmography but even then he was still doing field of dreams you know and stuff of that sort but yeah douglas it seemed that like in the starting in like the late 60s transitioning to the early 70s yeah, just it was just really uh, a struggle for him to uh, put forth material that was catching at the same level uh, as his past work, which is not to say that he didn't have any more good movies left than him. You know, he did The Fury with Brian De Palma, The Final Countdown, and uh, you know, The Man from Snowy River. But uh, definitely, his career had kind of met its its high point by the end of the late '60s. The thing about Douglas, though, is like again, he didn't he didn't he. He never phoned it in, and he was still doing interesting projects even at this point. So he was directing uh, himself in a couple movies. He also directed himself in the Western Posse. Also, was um, just uh, you know speaking to him more on a personal level is that you know some actors they kind of go into this time uh, in their careers where they're doing jobs that ostensibly could be considered maybe paycheck jobs or lesser jobs, and sometimes that coincides with you know maybe financial issues at home like they're just overspending living beyond their means and that wasn't the case with douglas i mean when he i mean even shortly before he died i remember there was an article about how him and his wife they had like this 90 million dollar trust and they gave half of it away to charity before he even died and yeah that's insane amount of money (laughs) you know so obviously he was financially sound 
So I don't know. I don't know if I, I, I'd kind of like to kind of get into that mindset of this part of his career. You know, some actors, they kind of go through this, this, this kind of a stretch and they get to the point of like, okay, I just need to stop and reassess things, which is kind of like what happened with someone like Matthew McConaughey, where his films were successful at the box office, but they were that same kind of rom-com, um, uh, kind of what he was, some people were considering as a uh, later fair. And he just kind of was like, all right, I need to stop and reassess and, and move from here. And other actors, they just keep, you know, following that, that path until it just, you know, 10 years pass and you're just, you know, you're the guest star in a TV movie of the week because that's, it damages your brand after, after a while. I think Douglas was still though, always, you know, he had had such success and such a, that great first 20 year, 15, 20 year run. And he had such, um, remarkable presence and, uh, that he was never diminished. I don't think, I don't think ever, ever was a time where some, they, he was not viewed as a true star, as a true film star. Um, for sure. And, and when he passed, he was one of the last alive of that golden, of that golden age. I think it's also interesting, you know, people like Douglas and Heston, Lancaster too, in many regards, is there actors who had this virility, even as they aged, like it's different now. Like, you know, there's all those jokes about how Tom, you know, Tom Cruise, when he made Mission Impossible 6, was the same age as Wolford Brimley and Cocoon. It's like, it's just different now because the role of, uh, you know, physique in an actor's success, you know, it's it's different now because there's so much more attention made in action films to, like, being jacked and, and, and being ripped. And, you know, actors will spend, like, this insane amount of time prepping for a role physically if they're going to play a superhero or something like that. And they're working with a trainer and they're, you know, putting 12 hours in at the gym. Um, you know, it's it, they go through these crazy rituals. Like, you know, I, I remember reading about Hugh Jackman preparing for um, the Wolverine, the the film he did right before Logan, the other one over in Japan. And, you know, the, for the fight on top of the train, he, uh, like, didn't eat anything or or I think he didn't even drink anything for, like, the day before the, sh- the fight so it would make his muscles look more defined. And he was, like, having a <laughs> trouble just staying on his feet. And just, like, these insane things that actors will do now um, to have the right physical look for a role. Whereas in, as in the era of kind of, like, like I mentioned, of the more golden age of filmmaking with Douglas and Heston and them, it was different. Like they just, they, actors like Douglas, who uh, was really in good shape even into his late age, it it just had this more rugged context to it. Um, I didn't get the impression that, you know, Douglas was coming from a, a meeting with his uh, nutritionist, specially assigned to him for the film, uh, where he was, deciding his calorie intake and how many hours he was going to put in in between setups uh you know in a trailer especially equipped with uh gym equipment you know i just get the impression that he was someone who was like just worked out a lot and just stayed in good shape and was just kind of had this rugged physicality to him and you see that in some some of these other guys around that time even as they got older they still maintained that and um i think it kind of adds to their already impressive uh, screen presence. Like people like Lancaster and Heston and Douglas were so dominating on the screen. They really were larger than life. Yet they, uh, you know, especially Douglas and Lancaster also had great talent. And Heston too. Heston was a very talented actor. I think that he gets underrated uh, for his actual natural acting abilities. But so they have these, these acting styles, which while believable and effective, again, also have these have such power to them. And then they were also these guys who just you know, were very active in, like I said, virile and, and, um, hands on too, uh, in these, in these roles. Uh, yeah, I remember seeing, uh, Burt Lancaster in the train, the classic 1965 film that he did with John Frankenheimer, world war two movie. And, you know, Kurt, I mean, I'm sorry, Lancaster had a background working as like an acrobat, I believe at the circus, like he had a really physical background before he even got in the film. And so there's a whole scene where he, it's like, he, he's watching something in a train yard from like a, uh, an observation shack or up on a gangway or something. And I just remember he it's like in one shot, he runs across like this gangway and then like slides down like a, like a three story tall, like pipe. Uh, it does it all in like one take. And it's obviously it's him doing it. And, uh, 
it just when stuff like that happens in a film, you're just like, oh wow, okay, this guy's he's someone to reckon with, <laughs> and uh, it's just always really impressive to see that. And I think it speaks to a certain um, a certain appeal to a certain class of uh, this this class of actors. These guys like like Douglas and Lancaster. But yeah, the chosen, oh, aka Holocaust two thousand. I don't know really how it did at the box office. Like I said, American International Pictures took the U.S. release. They called it The Chosen. They changed the ending a little bit. They basically shot a couple, some new insert shots with Douglas just walking around in an airport and then some other close-ups. It's really kind of a hack job, and it's stupid. Um, it, it changes the ending, uh, but it also is for no for no benefit, really. It's I don't know why they even bothered, frankly. But yeah, that's on the disc if you ever get a chance to to pick up the Blu-ray, which I believe it has been discontinued. It might already be out of print. Um, this is a Studio Canal title. It's owned by Studio Canal. Uh, and Shout Factory has allowed a lot of those titles from that deal to uh, expire. Um, but Kino Lorp has been picking some of them up. So maybe we'll eventually get an edition of this with some commentary tracks or something that would be nice to kind of... Um, understand more about the uh, making of this film and um, the experiences that they had on it. Especially if there's anything anyway, any kind of like uh, diary or journal, anything to kind of speak to uh, Douglas's uh, voyage on this on this film. But The Chosen aka Holocaust 2000. Check it out. Check it out. It makes a good it definitely makes a good wrap up. If you've watched the three Omen theatrical films do follow that whole story of Damien Thorne. I highly recommend uh, popping this in afterwards just to kind of see how someone else approached it to see a different a different take on the whole Antichrist mythology at that time. All right, that's going to do it for this week's episode of Carpet City Cinema. Uh, again, please uh, give us the links and the follows and the what have yous and the whatnots on whatever platform you are listening to us on and keep spreading the word about uh, this podcast. And thanks for tuning in and take care. Mm-hmm.